Thank you very much, Derek. Good. Well, good to be with you this morning, or this afternoon. This, afternoon. No, this morning when I started, so... Um, um, just to briefly say about myself, yeah, I live, I live in Harrow. I live in Harrowville, so uh, people think the idea that Harrow is really posh. Well, Harrow Hills, but as you come down, you can think it's less and less posh. Right? Harrow Hills, where they, they're the big public schools. I, uh, I've been in, in ministry for... Uh, since, uh, since I left Bible College back in 1981. Uh, so uh, I've been uh, a fair while. Um, mostly I've been two main aspects of my ministry. One is I've been managed with an organisation called Counties, uh, which I've worked with for 12 years. And uh, the most, well, most recent pastor that I had was as a Baptist pastor of a, a Baptist church, or senior pastor of a Baptist church in Wilster, which is, which is part of Harrow. Um, I have a family. I have a, a wife, Mandy, who is uh, also trained as a minister in the Bible College in the dim and distant past. And Mandy uh, is also an emergency nurse practitioner. She works in the local A&E. So, uh, they, they, nurse practitioners do the job that doctors use to do so often. You go to a hospital and you won't see a doctor if you can experience nurses treating. Uh, we have two children. We have Jonathan and Rebecca. Uh, John has just finished his A-levels, and just this last week, just five days ago, he was appointed as an intern working for the Baptist Church I used to pastor. So he's going to work the next year until the Lord is volunteering and uh, gets a bit of pocket money and all I think, but uh, mm -hmm. in serving God in the various aspects of youth and preaching and teaching, a whole host of other things, and he, he's looking possibly to, uh, to go to Bible College. So uh, much to everyone's heart, he's going to follow his parents' footsteps. <laughs> My daughter Rebecca, and uh, she is currently doing her A levels. So that's a, a little bit better. Up until recently, I've also been uh, taking time out to do a bit, a bit of study, and uh, just completed my, my master's degree. So I'm uh, free from being a student now, free from uh, free from the studies. And people have asked, well, what's next? Sometimes in life, you know, you reach your level. <laughs> Okay, let's let's pray. So we're gonna, we might want to look at uh, opening Bibles up to one Peter. You got them, or uh, you got got it on your phone, because these days most of us have tend to have to have phones or, or tablets or, or whatever these days. Um, one Peter chapter two and uh, verse four. Got four to four to anything else. Let's let's pray for a moment. Father God, we appreciate this is perhaps slightly an unusual event. But Father, you are still the same God. And you still have the same Holy Spirit. So Lord, I pray that as we look at your word, you may be able and willing to speak to us. Lord, we know you're able, but Lord, we can close the doors, we can close our minds, we can close our hearts. Lord, I pray that each of us may have open hearts just to listen to your voice, to bask in your presence, to learn from you, and to allow you to make a difference in our lives. Lord, give us things that are going to change us, that are going to challenge us. Give us things that we can take away and meditate upon and pray through and seek your will. Lord, just help me as I just minister these, these, these few words over these next few minutes. Lord, be with us, fill us with your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, 1 Peter chapter 2. And uh, I'm just going to look at a few verses, verses 4 to 10. I'm going to Spoken for several hours, but it's okay. I'm only going to speak for a few minutes. I'm not going to do the passage justice. And if you really want to do it justice, go home, sit down, pray through it, read it through, and allow God to speak. I um, my, my my children uh, go to Soul Survivor every summer, and uh, and they come back and give us tales of very if only before they go and especially uh, back in the on the phone. Say, oh, 300 people became Christians. Isn't that fantastic? Isn't that wonderful? And uh, they came back with the hotels and people being healed and people receiving guidance and lots of dramatic encounters with God. And there'll be other events and do one, a whole host of events over the summer. And some really great things are happening. I remember um, when I used to work with counties, one of the guys, uh, Roger, he came back and he gave a report. And we'd all stand, we'd all stand up and give these reports. And we'd stand in this, uh, he was at uh, Westminster Chapel in the Martin Lloyd Jones is on the pulpit, and we stand up and we give our report to about a thousand people, and we'd all say about, oh, we saw, you know, five people become Christians this, this year, or ten people become Christians, and 
um, one or two would say a few more than that. And Roger got up and he said, well, I've been off to um, Eastern Europe doing that. He was you know, preparing the way for a really great mission. Yeah, I'm just doing, introducing things, encouraging, motivating the church. And uh, he told hundreds and hundreds of people coming to faith. And yet in those like the church, people came to faith. And around the world, people are coming to faith. Uh, and, and yet we have the idea, we have the expectation of very little coming. Because we get excited when things happen in Soul Survivor as if it's a, a norm. But actually, that's the norm. That's what we read about in the Word of God. And millions of people are coming to faith. And yet, and people will see blessings, we'll see healings, we'll see God transform lives. And yet, I wonder what's missing. Well, I challenge myself and I challenge, challenge you, and I believe God will speak to us through these particular verses as to what, what, what needed, what could make that difference. Verse 4, and my Bible is entitled The Living Stone and the Chosen People. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For as scripture says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious stone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone, and a stone that causes men to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is what they were also destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him, who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Two pictures we'll look at. Two simple pictures. One about being the chosen people, and the other about being a spiritual house. The two pictures. Jesus himself said in Matthew, I will build my church. And, and Paul picks up this theme. He talks, or so Peter picks up this theme, and he uses the, the illustration of who Jesus is. He talks about Jesus in verse 4 as being the living stone, or the cornerstone, or the third picture is that of the capstone. The cornerstone is, and I'm, I'm not a builder, but a bit, a bit of a vague idea about buildings, um, but the cornerstone was, when you start building a wall or a house, you don't start in the middle, right? You start at the corner, and then all the lines are marked out from that stone in the corner, like that. Those first course of bricks at the bottom, and you sort of build up round, and then obviously your house miraculously appears over a, a period of time. But they need the first brick, they need the first stone, that everything else takes it bearing from. And in days gone by, it was a big stone, it wasn't just a, a little nice sort of 10 inch brick by like two by three or whatever. And that was a important stone. And so Paul uses this illustration of Jesus being the cornerstone, the most important stone, the most important part of the church. The capstone uh, was generally thought of to being uh, a different stone, but just as important. Uh, you, you see an arch of a building, but it keeps sort of turn of the century buildings, and usually they've got the arch at the front door, and there's a stone that's sort of shaped like that in the middle. And that's often thought of as being the capstone. There are other ideas might be. But it's important to know, because if you're building an arch, the stone in the middle is the one that stops it falling in, because there's nothing underneath the arch, so to speak. And so, again, it was the most important part of the building, a significant brick, a significant <coughs> stone. Jesus is the cornerstone, the capstone, the living stone. He is the centre of this building, this spiritual group, this spiritual house, this spiritual church. What about the church? What about the churches I've been part of? Where is Jesus? How much is he in the centre? You know what happens if you um, if you build a building and you don't start off getting your angles right and your direction right? Well, just try even something simple like hanging sheet of wallpaper and you get like, your angle lines wrong. It's a bit of a mess by the time you get around the other side. Well, you multiply that on a building and you get things wrong from the beginning. The house is in trouble. How often do we talk about my church 
or pastor or, or so-and-so's church. But God's church is his church. It's God's church. It's built on the foundation of Jesus. It's a spiritual house, not a temporal house. We are a spiritual beings, uh, beings being built into that church, into that building. What's the centre of our lives? What's the centre of the church? You see, we're designed to be living stones, the stones that make up that building. Is Jesus at the centre of our building? Is he the core part of this building, this church? Jesus is a living stone. We too are to be those living stones, those spiritual beings. Do we see ourselves as spiritual beings? Or do we see church life as, as what we can do, and what we can achieve? Or are we thinking about what can God achieve for me? What does God want to do with me? What is my part in this spiritual building? Oh, do you know something else about buildings and bricks? You, one brick on its own doesn't make a house. But put them all together, and notice that they're interlocked, right? You know how do you put bricks one on top of the other? Falls over. They're interlocked. They're all dependent upon each other. You pull start pulling a few bricks out, the thing starts to fall. So each of us, if we become Christians, we are living stones. And part of our function is to bond to one another, supporting that house, create, creating that building, recognising the importance of the other bricks, the other components, as part of the, the, those living, those, those vibrant living stones. We are to be those, those living stones in God's spiritual house. A chosen people, verse 9, we are chosen, we're talking about choosing today, you're looking to choose a new leader, whether it's me or somebody else, I don't know, but Jesus says, you are a chosen people. Okay. Peter here is talking about us being, being chosen, being especially, uh, can you remember your school days? Gosh, it's a long time ago, isn't it? Um, now, unfortunately, being my size, I, I generally got chosen for teams. So when you had to get a PD in your sport, um, anybody who was any size was reasonably quick in the, in the year group, you were probably okay, you were being chosen. Um, so I managed to scrape in, but imagine not being chosen. But it's good to do, everyone wants to be chosen, don't be left out and neglected. But here we are told that we are chosen people, that God has chosen us. Hey, God himself has chosen you. Wow, that. So we're special, there's something significant that he has chosen us. But he goes on, not only chosen, we are a royal priesthood. In Old Testament times, a priest was someone who was to be respected, someone to be looked up to, someone with a special privileged position. And uh, all those books, you know all those books that you don't read too often? If you hold your Bible, if you've got Bible, you can't do it with tablets and phones. Actually, this one's not bad. But you hold it, if you've got a Bible that you've been using for a few years, you notice that a bit of it's, a bit of it's clean and a bit of it's dirty. <laughs> The clean bit's what we call the Old Testament, and that's what we find out about all the priests. In fact, there's probably a particularly clean book around about the bit of this, and you find out all sorts of interesting things. Um, but they were chosen, they were, they were specially appointed, they had a special and significant role, and they were to intercede with God. They were to enter into, into the holy place, and, and yeah, they were people to be looked up to. They were to have direct access to God. But here, Peter is saying, you are the priest. You are not a priest. Do you feel priestly? So we don't need any, any, any physical ropes. But we are priests because we can directly intercede with God. We can have that direct access with God. One of the things that happened when Jesus died was that the temple was torn in two. So you've got your curtain down to it. Now the curtain wasn't the, you know, the, even the nearly blackout curtains, uh, they're only about that thing. This was a foot thick, and the whole thing, the temple curtain, was torn in two. So no longer was the barrier between God and man. No longer did they need a priest to go into the Holy Ghost, to go behind the curtains. But we have direct access to God. We have become a royal priesthood. We have become a holy nation. We have been people who have been set apart to do a job, to do a task. People who are belonging to God. He, he is our only, he is the person who we give our lives to. Not just anybody, not just anybody, but God himself. How special do you feel? Do you feel special? <laughs> <laughs> Smiles, great, fantastic, we're making 
progress. <laughs> because we're chosen. We're the royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. We, um, uh, maybe changing the picture slightly, but we had some, for, so one or two friends who, who adopted children. And often adopted children who can feel a bit sort of left out. Well, yeah, my children, they didn't have any choice. Or we didn't have any choice with our children. You know? They were born. That's it. We can't say, mm, don't like you, I'm going to send you back. We adopted children and chosen. And God what, didn't have us forced upon him. Because that sounds like a derogatory about children, the two families of kids. Um, God chose us. God chose you and me. He chose us to be that world priesthood, that holy nation. And God wants to use us. He wants us to do this service. He wants that, that relationship with us. And he's made a difference to our lives. He's called us out. Not as he called us to be that chosen people, that royal priesthood, that holy nation, people belong to him. He's called us out of darkness. He's called us out of darkness into the light. The transformation is enormous. I don't know if any of you have ever been caving. And have you been down some caves where they turn the lights out? Yeah. Few of you have. Um, usually the instructor, you have to have an instructor, like the people who know what they're doing, unless you're an expert. Uh, and invariably say, keep still. Sit down, keep still when we turn the lights out. And one of them turns the hell out and you the instructor for the last one out. It is pitch black. You can't see anything. It's never pitch black in London. Too much light. It's pitch black. And you have to keep still. It is dangerous. And yet, you always get somebody goodness, who presses the light on the watch. And that tiny little chink of light coming makes a massive difference. And Jesus called us out into the light. Not just a tiny bit of light from the watch, but into an enormous amount of light. And I think as Christians, those who are Christians, we need to recognise the difference. We need to recognise the contrast of what God has given and appreciate who we are before God. Appreciate what we are as a church into this spiritual house, bonded with Jesus, the cornerstone, the capstone, living, lively, vibrant. We are in a privileged position, living stones in a spiritual house. I wonder what sort of church you want to be. I heard something very, very recently, and it actually reminded me of something that I'd heard before. And maybe it sums up. Perhaps what church should be and the difference it can be. It's found in a book by a guy called Bill Hyde, which you might have heard of, he's, he's got a church in America. <laughs> and he talks about the potential of the church. Because the church isn't just about pastors and leaders and ministers, it's about the whole body of Christ. He talks about this passage, he talked about living, everybody being living stones. It doesn't say Jesus being the cornerstone of the big stone. Oh, then what's the other big stone? The Peter and Paul. As the ministers, they're big stones. We're all living stones, we're all equal. We've all made a difference. And uh, I'll read it to you. This is Bill Hyde speaking. I just finished presenting my weekend message at Widow, at Widow, and we're standing in the bullpen. I'm assuming it's a bit like the sanctuary or the, the men auditorium where, where they meet. Talking to people. A young married couple approached me, placed a blanketed bundle in my arms, and asked me to pray for their baby. I asked, what was the baby's name? The mother pulled back the blanket that had covered the infant's face. I felt my knees begin to buckle. I thought I was going to faint. Had the father not steadied me, I might have been well killed over. In my arms was the most horribly deformed baby I'd ever seen. The whole centre of her tiny face was caved in. How she kept breathing, I would never know. All I could say was, oh my. Oh my, oh my. Her name is Emily, said the mother. We've been told she has about six weeks to live, I live father. We would like you to pray before she dies that she will know and feel our love. Barely able to mouth the words I whispered, let's pray. Together we pray for Emily. Oh, did we pray. As I handed her back to her parents, I asked, is there anything we can do for you? Any way that we as a church can serve you during this time? Father responded with words that still amaze me. He says, Bill, we're okay. Really, we are. We've been in this loving small group for years. Our group members knew this pregnancy had complications. 
They were at our house the night we learned the news. And they were at the hospital when everything was delivered. They helped us absorb the reality of the whole thing. They even cleansed our house and fixed our meals when we brought her home. They prayed for us constantly and called us several times a day. They are even helping us pray and uh, plan Emily's funeral. Just then, three other couples stepped forward. And surrounded Emily and her parents. We always attend church together as a group, said one of the group members. She picked her up, carried her away. Let's pray. Father, as we think about church, maybe as we thought about that as an example, of those living stones in action, caring for that family, going through the most dreadful crisis, a crisis that probably maybe none of us could ever appreciate what it's really like to go through, and yet there were the living stones in action, giving that support, just ordinary members, just being that world priesthood, being those chosen people, seeking to give care and support. Lord, I pray for this church, whatever happens, that they may be people like that small group, like those who cared for Emily's parents, who spend that time praying for them and ministering to them. Lord, help us all to see that we are living stones, that there's life and vitality within this church at Trinity. Lord, may we be people who see Jesus. People who see Jesus at the centre, as the cornerstone, as the base on which we build your church, Lord. As the basis on which we seek to minister and to share the glorious good news of Jesus. Father, thank you that in, in your church we depend on one another. As those bricks linked and locked together, Father, thank you. You've given us your Holy Spirit. Lord, at times we probably feel weak and inadequate. And we feel as if we can't really be royal priest. We can't really be that chosen people, that holy nation. But Lord, we thank you that you do equip us. And you want to make a difference in our lives. As we seek to be the church of the churches that you want us to be. The people that you would have us be. Lord, make a difference in our lives, we pray. Lord, reveal to us what you would have us do, who we should be, how we can become those holy people, that holy nation. Father, thank you that we belong to you. Thank you for your mercy that you've sent to us in Jesus. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your sufficiency. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the cross.